Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black, everything. So welcome to Left in Black. My name is Sasha Panaram, and I'm a graduate student in the English department here at Duke. And today we're joined on the show with Professor Nigel Cunningham. Professor Cunningham is an assistant professor of English at Hunter College in New York. He's also the Kotzen Postdoctoral Fellow at the Princeton Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So I want to begin our discussion by talking a little bit about what brings you to Duke and to Durham. So later tonight, you're going to be on a panel called New Directions in Black Transnational and Diaspora Studies, which is organized by Professor Jarvis McInnes, an assistant professor of English here at Duke. And the event itself is growing out of the Representing Migration Humanities Lab. Mm -hmm. And so by way of introduction, talk a little bit about what you work on within the discipline of English. And without giving away too much, what are you <laughs> going to be talking about tonight? Um, yeah, so um, I have the pleasure of being invited by um, Jarvis McGinnis as part of this lab. And uh, I think what comes to mind about what I'm presenting right now is how much is informed by questions of intellectual friendship in a sense of what times and moments do we encounter people that you know pull us in different directions. Um, I find it kind of fitting that somebody who's been an interlocutor over a long period of time and meeting other people who have been interlocutors with me without knowing have allowed me to come here and just think out loud, right? Um, I started with this question about intellectual friendship precisely because I think that's something that falls away from how we understand our intellectual histories. Um, those kinds of unverifiable, more informal attachments, passions, and desires that we may exchange amongst each other that I'm trying to think about in regards to um, how we understand political time. So Waiting for Happiness is a title mm -hmm. of my talk today, and it, um, it's making an allusion to a Maurice Condé novel named Harry Makanon and um, uh, Abiriman Sasasko's film Harry Makanon from 2002, I believe, as well. <clears throat> But this idea of waiting for happiness um, is not only just a kind of gesture towards um, patience or even towards a certain kind of failure or lack of happiness, but I'm really thinking about the waiting as a space upon which we attend to each other. Right? So again, starting with intellectual friendship, you know, maybe the very ways that we attend to each other, wait on each other, wait with each other, provide the very grounds for how we as scholars um, come to even define ourselves and create our own intellectual biographies. Of course, my project is less so about intellectual histories and intellectual lives, more so about the kinds of um, ways that people carve out life chances or even um, grapple with the, the non-arrival of their own expected futures within um, spaces that otherwise would be named as waiting, you know, inactive. And what kind of languages do we have? Um, what kind of conceptual frameworks are available to try to attend to, to give account of what happens in the space of waiting. I mean, in a way, um, we've all been born into someone else's waiting. <laughs> and uh, I'm interested in um, maybe getting a, a, a language that could get after that thickness of time that informs uh, our own positions within you know, these diasporic histories. I mean, this is my own bi biographical understanding of myself. You know, how do I make a sense of the, 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 the time of waiting that I was born into, mm. right? Somebody else's failure is actually constitutive of my own possibilities of imagining a future. Um, so I'm riffing off right now. I don't want to give too much. But um, mm -hmm. that's where I'm at. You sort of walked into my second question, which was to ask you to speak out loud about time and temporality mm -hmm. in your work. Partly because I want to say that it's like ongoing temporalities or unfinished temporalities. Yeah. Very much like, as you point out in the way you name your work, the non-arrival of black freedom or yeah. waiting for happiness, notes on delay. And I'm really curious about sort of why thinking about belatedness and postponement and, and even anticipation, why mm -hmm. that's productive for the work that you do. I do have to say that when I read your work, and, and this is a sense I get, so um, neither a critique nor a compliment, just a sensibility. <laughs> but um, there's a way that when I'm encountering your work, it's as if I'm late to the game. Mm -hmm. um, part of that, I mean that two ways. Uh, one in the sense that 
I'm entering an ongoing conversation mm -hmm. that I'm trying to catch up to. Yeah. Um, and you could say that of any scholarly work in a certain yeah. sense. But also, sometimes the thing that you're trying to describe, you know, maybe that's freedom at one point, maybe that's something else, it becomes more elusive as mm -hmm. you name it. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes out of reach, out of grasp. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I guess one of the only things that, I shouldn't say one of the only things, but something that comforts me in that moment when I'm reading then, is that if I'm late to the game, so are you. <laughs> you know, there's two of us yeah. um, in that moment. And yeah. you know, at least there's two is better than one in a certain yeah. type of sense. So continue to talk a little bit about temporality insofar as um, thinking about the way that it really, what are in those moments in between? What are, you talk about non-arrival of black freedom. Again, what's happening in that space? Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. I, I really enjoy the way that you even just formulate my own thinking because I'm just groping at possibilities right now. But the belatedness in the sense of uh, a certain kind of anticipation that may not be our own, you mm -hmm. know, how do a lot of my projects and my interests are trying to grapple with the futures that we've inherited from the past. Mm -hmm. um, another way to, to even think about that is how we're born into traditions that are already unfolding before we arrived. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> the kind of elusiveness that you are pointing towards as well as that belatedness is my own attempt at, um, on the one hand, responding to a certain kind of hubris that I myself have uh, about the present, you know, that is as if you know, the time I was born into has to be the time of political. It is as if the time that we're born into, the present, has to be the occasion for the realization of all these hopes and dreams that came before us. Right? So I'm myself grappling with my own location within projects that existed well before I came into the scene and for futures that I may never see, right? And how can that be the grounds for my critical practice? You know, this unstable, rickety ground in a sense that instead of trying to narrate my own historical position as the, the time when freedom must arrive, mm -hmm. or even narrate it as the time when all possibilities have been foreclosed, I'm interested in the kind of ways in which non-arrival is not marking a failure, nor is it, I'm interested in the way that non-arrival is not marking a failure, but rather becomes a space where we find these recursive repetitions of possibility and potentials and overlapping temporalities that inform my everyday life. Um, I'm interested not only in just non-arrival, but how thinking about non-arrival may signify or allow us to come into contact with what I'm calling a haunting refrain. Mm -hmm. um, the ways in which the past um, futures that have in, in, informed our present you know, echo inside of our own sensibilities and how we might be haunted by those possibilities, but in the very way that we address them we transform those as, as well. I mean, a refrain is a really fascinating poetic mm -hmm. device, right? It's a repetition, but in the repetition, it transforms the original. Right. Too, right? It's a signification almost, like it goes back to the return that changes the refrain. Yeah. I need to quote you on that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk a little bit more about the non-arrival of yeah. Black Freedom, that particular um, article that you have out in Women in Performance. So it was an issue that was edited by Dr. Nicholas Oscar Sparks and Dr. Sampade Aranke on the occasion of 20 years of scenes of subjection. And I love the way that you open it, sort of the way that you talk about how you were touched by scenes. And there's a way that you had encountered scenes of subjection in Sadia's Hartman's work, even before formally being introduced um, to the text itself. And you use this phrase, uh, living with living with, you say like, this is the dizzying experience of living with scenes, or this is the generative experience of living with scenes. And I was thinking about that phrase, living with, very recently, because mm. um, just a couple of weeks ago, I watched this talk that Professor Elizabeth Alexander gave, mm. and it was called Why I Write, and mm -hmm. it was given on the occasion of a literary reception prize. And in it, she talks about this moment when three of her mentors pass away, mm -hmm. her literary mentors. So Gloria Naylor, Michael S. Harper, Derek Walcott, 
people who not only introduced her to the black literary tradition, but also made real for her her space in that place. Mm -hmm. um, as a 19, 20 year old young woman who's coming into her own voice, um, very much affirmed her presence. And she talks in that moment, she talks about the fact that um, when they passed away in that year, she found herself reaching for their text. Like that mm -hmm. was the thing that she could do to comfort herself. And it was something about holding it, touching it, caressing it. You know, the physicality of having the book with her, you know, almost to the point of cradling it, mm -hmm. where that for her, the language she uses, she says it let her keep wake with the elders. You mm. know, this is what it meant to keep wake with the elders. And I was thinking again about living with because Though when you describe scenes of subjection in, in Sadia Hartman, those are texts that are very much alive and yeah. people that are with us. But the way that she was talking about reaching for those books, it's very much talking about being embraced or being enveloped and encircled and, and bringing back ancestral presence um, mm -hmm. into the current moment. And then the other thing when she was talking, I was thinking, you know, in as much as like there's something to be said for the physicality of holding the book, yeah. There's also something to be said for reaching for the text. Yeah. You know, something's happening in that moment too that yeah. perhaps we can't name. Yeah. Um, so in light of all that, I'm wondering if you could talk about other texts that you've lived with. So say you had to pick three things, <laughs> you know, you think about your own intellectual formation, how we got Dr. Nigel Cunningham. Yeah. Um, what would those three things be? You know, text broadly, it could be books, it could be music, it could be film, art, what have you, but yeah. three things move us through. Yeah, I, I want to say first that I, the way that you even just formulate this kind of, you know, phenomenological conceit of reading, right? Mm -hmm. That reading is not just uh, an engagement with the work, but it's a reaching out, right. grabbing it, picking it up, mm -hmm. that you're even, you know, providing different ways for us to talk about what's at stake in our reading practice. Mm -hmm. My living with scenes of subjection, the very idea of that came about by just looking at how tattered the book was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? yeah, so there's yeah. something in the materiality that speaks to my relationship uh, to the text definitely. in a physical form, but also the text and its own legacies and influences. Are there are other texts, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. that um, I find myself reaching for. Um, I would name at least um, Asada Shakur's um, autobiography, mm. um, which I was asked to speak about um, recently. And for that, it's more so these moments where she names locations that I grew up in, Jamaica, Queens, Springfield Gardens. And it was the first time that I could see myself as part of a larger story mm. when encountering that work. Um, but also the fact, the way that she moves back and forth through time, you, you know, again, destabilizes where I find myself, right? Like, where do I find myself in the Sada Shakur story? Or how does the Sada Shakur lay the groundwork for me to come into the scene? But I don't even know that until I pick up the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, another, an, another two texts, I mean, I, I want to say in the break, but I think, mm. um, in a way, I reach for Fred Moten and Sadia Hartman at the same time. <laughs> yeah. um, but two other quick texts would be, um, I've been thinking about a lot, Renee, a track um, by the Lost Boys, um, by Lost Boys, pardon me, mm. um, a legal drug money album, 1995, I believe, um, because it, it, you know, it's this idea of a ghetto love is the law that we live by is what the, one of the refrains. But it's allowing me to think about the forms of intimacy and attachments that unfold within supposedly spaces of violence and, and degradation, let's say, you know, the ghetto, mm -hmm. and how that those intimacies and forms may provide methods for us to tell stories that cannot be told. Stories about Renee, uh, a girl that, you know, Mr. Cheeks encounters on the street, but then the very same street that he encounters and falls in love with her is where she gets shot down, right? Mm -hmm. How do you tell a story um, through, about this, woman, Renee, when the only words we have about her is through Mr. Cheeks, right? Mm -hmm. There's a way in which I'm also now trying to listen to and reach for these, these texts that I was informed by as a kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lost Boys, and I grew my dreadlocks because of them. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, it was uh, it's a t-shirt I have um, um, that um, reads, it's orange and it reads, shut down Guantanamo. And it, before, one night where I got it, um, it was a t-shirt to protest the, um, the camps in Guantanamo after, mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the, the what we so-called war on terrorism. 
And the fact that the t-shirt no longer holds together, for me, captures or at least approximates the unimaginable temporal experience of that ongoing confinement, mm. right? How is the history of our present um, could be told through the tattering of that t-shirt? And what are the ethical, moral, and claims to even justice that are unsayable that the t-shirt, for me at least, captures? So every time I put it on, it's also, it's also mm -hmm. that the tattering is how it's sticking to my own flesh too, right? right, right. <laughs> so it's, it's in a way that I, I'm- contact. Yeah, there's yeah. a weird contact with history inside of this shirt. And I've been, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've been looking at it because I can't wear it anymore because it's literally tattered. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been trying to think about, you know, what does it mean to live mm. the breakdown of that shirt? Yeah. yeah. Now, what I love about all three objects that you sort of strung together in, in the response to my question, sort of what you said in the middle, where we're talking about like, what are these stories that we cannot tell, yeah. that we want to tell, it, it like rings true of like M. Norbessi Philip, like yeah. a story that can't be told, that must be told, yeah. that type of thing. Um, quickly about Asada, and then I'll move on, because I was actually just looking at the text again very recently. For me, one of the things when I think about that text is how the role of poetry, how that functions mm -hmm. in and throughout. Um, you talking about sort of locations and how you're coming into recognizing that you're already part of something in the mm -hmm. way that she names things. But for me, it's also been, you know, going back to what are these things that can't be told and then mm -hmm. how do we start to tell them? Yeah. And the very fact that that book opens with a poem, a poem, yeah. you know, affirmation, you know, the very first line, I believe in living. Yeah. And, um, you know, for me, you know, it goes on to say, you know, I believe in living, you know, I believe in the magic of hands, the wonder of eyes, I believe in rain and tears and, and the blood of infinity, I believe in life. Yeah. You know, there's something there in so far as, you know, multiple points throughout the text, she'll say, I'm really not sure how to write about this, and then a poem appear, appears yeah. in some form, um, emerges. And so I've just been thinking about, you know, what are the forms that we're called upon or drawn to, to at least try to tell the things that we want to say and that we think should be heard. Yeah. Um, that's just what I've been thinking about in regards to that text. But I'm going to shift us a little bit. Um, not too far, actually, because I still want to talk about the non-arrival of black freedom. You're probably getting the sense that this text has been like really important for me as I've been doing my own work, so thank you. But um, you do so much in that piece. You talk about scenes, you talk about a reading of Oliver L. Jackson's untitled and then dated photograph, or painting rather. Um, you talk, you do this interesting meditation on tenderness and touch at the very end. And what I'd like to do actually in talking about this particular article is to not talk about something in the article proper per se, but to read you a footnote that you wrote and then ask you to respond to it. And I'll sort of explain after I read it why I'd like you to hear, just talk more about it, if that's okay. All right. So in the article you say, um, in the footnote, I came across David Kazana John's brilliant reflections on the epistolary while finalizing this article and regret not having the space or time to reflect on the overlaps and divergences between the non-arrival of black freedom and Kazana John's formulation of the brink of freedom where quotidian globalities come into view. And part of the reason I want to call attention to that is because I do think that the way that academia is structured we oftentimes don't get to hear people go back and reflect or expound upon or revise things that they've written. It's not that it doesn't happen, but I don't think it happens as often as it could. And I think part of that is the impulse to think about what's next? What's the next project? What's the next idea? What's the next thing? Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to hear you speak to that particular footnote because I think one, I'm just curious to see how you find his work influencing your own thought. But um, apart from that, I know you have an interest in labor, and I feel like this would be a good place to, to speak to that. Mm -hmm. I'm just need two seconds to wrap my head around this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, I. I'm surprised that I, I'm surprised you picked up on that footnote. It, on one hand, it was a, a brief aside, but on the other hand, I think you are picking up on something that's very important to my own intellectual practice, which is always being open to revision. The thinking about reading and writing as part of a larger project versus, I think, what you're talking about as a certain kind of narrative of, 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 of a certain kind of progression, arrival, or mastery, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, 
for me, footnotes, and it's always been the case, you know, from, from reading you know, Wretched of the Earth or Black Skin, White Mask, footnotes is where the social happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think um, what I was trying to do there was trying to not even just point to the revision um, or how I was you know, late to the game in reading David Kajan's work, but it, it was a way of me, for me just to even mark where I was at a particular moment of time. So when I come back, I know mm -hmm. the social mm -hmm. landscape that I'm inside of. Um, I, I believe that there is a certain kind of intellectual labor that a footnote does that we could you know, mobilize in the sense that it um, not only cites and brings other people into conversation, but it also demonstrates you know, who has provided the basis for you to make your claims, mm. right? Um, and I think with David Kazanja's work, it was, it was a brief moment where I, I saw myself, and I think the footnote was kind of a cop-out in this regard, mm -hmm. I saw myself overlapping but I didn't know how. Mm. I didn't know how in the moment of inside of my work, I didn't know how and why I wanted to listen to him. Mm. So I just left a little marker for myself for me to come back later on. Mm. And I, I, I think, you know, I can't really extrapolate more <coughs> of, of, of why and how. I love that you picked up on it. I, I, I would love to know what you think it does. Mm. Um, because for me, it was just, uh, it was almost a, a habitual thing. I felt that I had to at least say, who I was thinking with. Mm. Um, and writing is, writing is an experience that unfolds in time. So, of course, you're not going to read everything <laughs> on the topic, especially if it's coming out while you're writing it. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's something I'm grappling with as well. You know, mastery kinds of, kind of assumes as if, you know, I'm isolated in this room, I have this idea, then mm. I send it out into the world. Um, I, I am not only thinking about living with text, but also thinking with others, mm -hmm. and how there might be a certain kind of collaborative sensibility that we could uh, animate in our own writing practices and decisions to put in the footnote yeah. where otherwise we may not have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's wonderful. I've been thinking a lot about just footnotes in general, mm -hmm. um, and actually in relation to footsteps. So mm. that, that's sort of actually what my work is on, thinking about movement and mm -hmm. sort of um, exactly how you say the way that a footnote sort of traces our intellectual, the people who we're thinking with. There's very much, I think, something happening with footsteps too. Like who mm -hmm. makes it possible for us to walk in the mm -hmm. first place? Um, who has taught us to walk? Who has taught mm -hmm. us to, given us the tools to mobilize ourselves? And I think uh, there's something akin to thinking about footnotes in relationship to footsteps. Yeah. And um, I'm only recently coming on to like the brink of freedom by way of your work and sort of thinking, where does this take us if we yeah. take up this um, notion of, of sort of how freedom is formulated and how it then gets um, mobilized and where does he get that notion from because he's talking about Liberia and Yucatan and yeah. sort of places that I've never, or not, I shouldn't say never, but I don't think about as much in my own work and mm -hmm. so what does it do to then direct our attention to these disparate parts of the world and, as well? And I mean a, a footstep is, is, is a trace of, yes, a, a, a presence, but it doesn't mean that's the only presence. You know, you might be carrying somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think what's also really exciting about yeah. um, uh, the, 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 the way you think about footnotes, where you think about footsteps, where you think about traces, is that a trace is not only you know pointing to something that was there, but it also speaks to what seeps outside of the very categories of signification we have, mm -hmm. right? Inside of a footnote, it's not, for instance, it's not simply that, you know, everyone who quotes Sylvia Winter and Orlando Patterson are just gesturing to those people. For me, when I see two of those people inside of the same article, mm. I'm saying, okay, what is Jamaica in the 1960s doing? Yeah. Who else is inside of this world, mm -hmm. right? When we, when we gesture to some other text or some other time and space, what are the, uh, what are the kind of unverifiable presences that we could actually activate? just by following where this footnote is going to mm. take us. I think what I love about the footsteps part is, is you know, you know, it's not about retracting the footsteps. Mm -mm. The footsteps are just a, a trace of something else that we ourselves have to imaginatively, imaginatively leap into. Yes. And is, can that be a critical practice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not just a recovery. Can that be a practice of thinking with others that we may not never ever know? I mean, this mm -hmm. is Norbasi Phillips's 
work in Zong. She's mm -hmm. thinking with those that she needs to name at the very moment she knows that she can never recover their presence. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's in that gesture that she could conjure or at least evoke presences that she needs to make certain claims. Possible. possible. Yeah. yeah. No, this word that you just used, activate, um, I think a lot about that in relation to the brink of freedom and mm -hmm. sort of the way that the author has to construct his own archive yeah. to even make it possible to, again, say those stories yeah. that need to be said, but we don't know quite how we're going to say them. Um, with that said, I, I want to shift a little bit to think, I know you curated a show at Princeton last year, a couple of years ago, um, called Hold, and I just want to hear a little bit more about sort of your process of curation, why did you call it Hold, the meditation on black aesthetics, what objects did you put in conversation with one another. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very different mode than, say, writing in mm -hmm. some senses, but not maybe not entirely different. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, it was, I stumbled into the opportunity, um, and I'm very grateful for the people at the Princeton University Art Museum, Laura Giles, Veronica Wright, Julie Odweck, um, the director, um, James Stewart, uh, everyone for just giving me the opportunity to think out loud in a space. Mm. Um, I'm not a curator by, tra by training, but I've had the opportunity to work with um, scholars such as um, um, Bob O'Mealy, uh, Deidre Harris Kelly, um, Danny Dawson, um, who themselves have been thinking about curation um, in a very critical way for understanding how we tell the story of and the histories of jazz in, in, in new and complex ways. And it was working with them that I realized that the exhibition form is a thinking form. Mm. So hold was, you know, one of my students, you know, she says, you know, hold is a way of talking about the intimacy of objects, right? That a hold is not so much trying to say that this is black aesthetic, but hold is, you know, can we bring things together enough that we could start talking, telling the story of black aesthetics? Um, just enough traction or just enough um, connections for us to get moving. Right. So my, my, my decisions with that was trying to, when I was choosing works, was trying to not so much give a totalized vision of what I think a black aesthetic is, but to you know, give different nodal points and find resonances. So when you walk inside of the exhibition space, it's not just your encounter with one visual art object, but how that encounter echoes another. Mm. You know, how do we um, think about uh, for instance, Amy Césaire's uh, aesthetic, pardon me, how do we, how do we think about Wilfredo Lamb's own engagement, what people call a kind of you know, decolonial aesthetic, precisely when Jane Cortez is writing about his work in poetry, actually put the poem next to mm. one of Wilfredo Lamb's work, and the, the poem is called looking at a Rafael Lamb poem. And it's by putting those two objects together that I was hoping to just create a resonance or a space for us to see differently and read differently. Um, when she herself is talking about the encounter, how can that provide a way or a training for us to move through the rest of the exhibition space? Um, it was an experiment of thought for me, and I learned a lot, um, and I have a newfound appreciation for curatorial practice. Yeah. Uh, one of my uh, good friends and colleagues just installed the uh, Soul of the Nation at the Brooklyn Museum, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it is, it, it, it's it, just to see the, the accents, the echoes, um, just to realize that when we're inside of an exhibition space, we're, we're thinking with other people who may not even be there. And she provided, Ashley James, she provided that space, and I, I feel grateful for the work that people like her Thomas Lax, uh, these, these amazing, brilliant young curators who are making spaces for us to think with and about black art. No, hmm. yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I was gonna say, I'm trying to think back to the last exhibit I saw myself. And I saw something at the Nasher, but that aside, the last thing I saw in New York was an exhibit at the Whitney Museum. Um, I think it's called like, History Keeps Me Awake at Night. Hmm. And, uh, it was really fascinating just the, as you speak about sort of the process of putting objects together and sparking and initiating conversation and sort of what bumps up against each other, I guess, in a certain sense. But I was also thinking as I was moving through that particular exhibit, 
I'm thinking about the way that museums, on the one hand, offer us a space to think with and do mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying, but then also it can sanitize history in a certain type yeah. of way. And so for me, thinking about that particular exhibit and sort of there's a way that what I appreciated about it was sort of moving through it and being able to construct my own narrative yeah. about how these objects are coming together and then seeing how that resides, you know, over and against, say, the curatorial statement that's right next yep. to And so, um, and, and sort of what happens after you leave the museum, too. Like, I was familiar with that artist, like, more of his, his art pieces and not necessarily his writing, but it made me go back to, like, close to the knives and be mm -hmm. like, okay, let's talk about this text. What does mm -hmm. it do? Doing in relation to say the things that I just saw, mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm always curious. Again, going back to movement, how do we move through these spaces, yeah. and then where do we go when we're done? And, and I mean, the, the show's David Winor, which is show, yes, and, and what's, what's incredible about David Winor, which is show, is that it's in the Whitney, but his writing, his experiences was a, emerging out of a west side of Manhattan that is not the west side of the no, Whitney right? 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 So, so right now, you're yeah. off to, you're inside this like Whitney space and it's, it's like wait a second where, <laughs> where am I literally where am I where, where yeah. am I and um, there's there's an exhibition in, in, in Houston right now called Walls Turned Sideways Are Bridges okay. which is about prisons and museums and a curator she's also interested in you know how does the institutionality of museums delimit what can and cannot be said mm -hmm. or even curated inside those spaces, but what kind of practices, curatorial, pra curatorial practices, might intervene mm. in the museum, and not just you know the museum without walls, transcending the walls and creating this democratic vision of all these images together, no, by actually seeing that you know what's at stake in putting objects together is pushing at the limits of what's stable. It's a question about justice, mm -hmm. and that maybe by coming inside the museum space, we're trying to push these institutions to realize a world that they're not even ready for, right? But we're doing that work by thinking and moving through and, mm -hmm. you know, telling different stories and sitting here and talking about David Wood Norwich. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So last question. Um, a couple things I want to pull together. So you figure out how you want to speak about which one. So one, I want to hear you talk about Sylvia Winter mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the work that you've done around her. But two, I'm also thinking about you talk a lot about sociopoetics of death in your work. And, and I want to know what about that space? Um, for you, and, and I suppose you've talked about this throughout our conversation, but what about death as such a productive space, a critical space of thought, um, a place where this non-arrival, where this temporality can unfold? And, and, mm -hmm. And you know, not to not to say that we're like romanticizing death and making it or anything like that, but sort of thinking about the way that perhaps you can put it in conversation with winter or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think uh, one text that I will reach to right now, just to mm -hmm. continue that metaphor, yeah. would be um, Diana Fuss's uh, sh small monograph on elegies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's called, um, if I'm not mistaken, Dying Modern, I believe. Okay. Um, and there she's making an argument about reading elegies to track a, the cultural and historical transformation of ideas of death. So um, when I'm talking about the social poetics of death and dying, um, I think you know I want to underline the poetics part of it. So literally thinking about elegy and what does what do elegies do in different moments in time? Um, in the New World Quarterly issue, um, this is a, a Caribbean journal that emerged. Um, right um, during moments of decolonization, I think an issue in 1965, there's a poem dedicated to Malcolm X by Sylvia Winter. And for me, reading her elegy dedicated to Malcolm X, which is not inside of Elegies on the Life of Death of Malcolm X, which is a collection I was put on Broadside Press in 1965. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By encountering that work and, and, and thinking about you know, what is the form of compensation that she is holding out for? And realizing how poetry, the elegy form itself, not just simply tries to get over loss, but also recodes death. Right? It takes death as a platform for envisioning not just future possibilities, but envisioning you know, what is just even sayable. Again, just keep on going back to this mm -hmm. theme. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, for me, What's so exciting about thinking with Sylvia Winter about the sociopoetics of death, and this kind of goes back to our conversations about citations and footnotes, is 
for me is, you know, which Sylvia Winter? Mm. Because 1965 Sylvia Winter writing about Malcolm X in, in a poetic form, um, this is after she returns from her travels abroad, you know, dancer, <laughs> scholar, um, writer, and this is before her critique of the human. You know, I believe that in that way that she always rethinks and revises her own thought allows me to track the different meanings and generativity that death represents in different moments in time, right? So Malcolm X's death had a particular socio-poetic force than mm. you know, the death of his grandson, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which itself has too many scary resonances, right? Malcolm X's grandson is the arrival of his namesake who dies after setting the very fire that Betty Shabazz dies within too. So now we see death is not a singular death, mm -hmm. but it's these different resonances in which finitudes force us to recraft the story about the coming of the Messiah, right? How can the, the, the second coming of Malcolm X, you know, what a lot of black radicals are holding out for, its realization has come and gone mm -hmm. um, as an ongoing story of death, but death is never the same in each right, moment, right? right? Now what you're picking up on about force, it's making me think a lot about what Soyika Dix Colbert writes about, the difference between being bound by death mm -hmm. and, and such that the person can't necessarily grow or there's no space for an advancement mm -hmm. versus living with death. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, same type of work that say Sharon Holland or Carl Carla Holloway yeah. is doing with passed on or raising the dead. Yeah. Um, the force aspect of that, there yeah. is something that compels us. Um, it could be forward or backwards, I suppose, yeah. in a certain type of way as well. But no, thank you for sort of speaking to that because I was just curious to see, as you say, the poetics also plays a really big part in so far as thinking about what it means for you, how you write about um, the work that you write about. Yeah. You know, just the form that it takes itself. Yeah, 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 I, 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 you're, you're pushing me to go back and read these yeah. poems. I think something's happening on the form and one of the ways I think about that, so thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So we've been joined today by Professor Nigel Cunningham. Professor Cunningham is an assistant professor of English at Hunter College in New York. He's also the Kotzen Postdoctoral Fellow at the Princeton Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts. Thanks for speaking with me today. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black, 